Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Duncan Williams, and I'm the chair of the Center for Japanese Studies here at UC Berkeley. On behalf of our Center for Japanese Studies and our co-sponsors, the UC Berkeley Haas School of Business, uh, the IAES Schorenstein Fund, the Consulate General of Japan, and the Foreign Ministry of Japan, let me welcome you to, to, to this afternoon's program, a lecture and conversation with Mr. Inamori Kazuo. We are honored to host Dr. Inamori as part of the Center for Japanese Studies' 50th anniversary program, a program featuring Japan's leading innovators in fields as varied as architecture, diplomacy, literature, pop culture, and today, business and technological innovation. I'll be introducing Dr. Inamori in a moment, but let me first invite Consul General of Japan in San Francisco, Yasumasa Nagamine, to offer a few words of welcome as well. Council General. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, William, the Director of uh, Japanese Study of uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, Chairman Inamori, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my great pleasure uh, that the Consul General of Japan in San Francisco together with Center for Japanese Studies of the UC Berkeley and Haas School of Business uh, of UCB, um, presenting today's program, a conversation on business innovation and the philosophy of Kazuo Inamori. First of all, I congratulate the Center of, for Japanese Studies of uh, UCB and its director, Dr. Williams, on their 50th anniversary. Today's event, is a part of the year-long anniversary events planned and conducted by the University of California Berkeley Japanese Study Center. Um, now it is my privilege as a representative of a sponsoring uh, organization, Consulate Office of Japan, uh, to present Dr. Kazuo Inamori, chairman of the Kyocera Corporation one of the prominent Japanese business leaders in Japan today. Dr. Inamori is the founder of Kyocera Corporation and leading electronics manufacturer, and also a KDDI, the second largest in Japan's telecommunication industry. He is known for his unique management philosophy, which has had a significant impact on his fellow businessmen. I will rely on uh, Dr. William to further introduce uh, Dr. Inamori to you. I would like to express my gratitude to Chairman Inamori for taking time from his busy schedule to be with us today and offer his talk to us. This is going to be a very interesting talk about the company he created and developed to be a world leading company in the world. The economic crisis we face is the greatest challenge for the business uh, in the world, maybe the first of this kind in many decades. And Japan also is a part of that downturn of the economy. Yet, Japan is still right behind the United States at number two in overall GDP. And the wealth held by Japanese is enormous. We have such excellent Japanese companies as Kyocera, Sony, Panasonic, Toyota, to name just a few, actively engaged around the world. Furthermore, Japan's industrial capacity for research and development remains among the top in electronics, precision instruments, raw materials, and the field of energy conservation. Despite the severe economic conditions of the 1990s and after, Japan continued to lead in innovative manufacturing. I am therefore optimistic about the future of Japan's economy as long as Japan retains this innovative capacity. As the founder of the company, Chairman Inamori 
developed Kyocera into one of the top companies in the world, and most certainly its success has been due in part uh, to the unique innovative manufacturing process and the underlying philosophy of which we are proud. It is my hope that the audience will come away with a deeper understanding of the workings of the Japanese industry, the power of Japanese technology and creativity, and the management philosophy of one of the Japan's foremost business leaders. This coming Saturday, February 7th, the consulate will sponsor Japan Innovation Forum, at which time Chairman Inamori will speak. And once again, I sincerely thank him for his giving us this opportunity to hear him. Finally, I want to express my sincere gratitude once again to the uh, co-sponsors, Center for Japanese Studies, Haas School of Business, and the Japan Society of Northern California for collaborating with us to make this event possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council General. And, and as the Council General uh, suggested, I, I'd like to take a few moments to uh, further introduce Dr. Inamori. As many of you know, uh, Dr. Inamori Kazuo is not only one of Japan's most well-known entrepreneurs as the founder and chairman emeritus of Kyocera Corporation, but he's a philanthropist, an innovation leader, a Zen Buddhist priest, and a keen supporter of his Tokyo-based, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, very sorry, Kyoto-based <laughs> Sangha soccer team. Through his unique management philosophy, he's also an example and an inspiration to tens of thousands of Japanese business owners and entrepreneurs. Born in 1932 in Kagoshima, Japan, Inamori Kazuo is a graduate of Kagoshima University, but also has received honorary doctorates from a number of universities in the United States, in the UK, and in Japan. In 1959, at the age of 27, he established the Kyocera Corporation, originally the Kyoto Ceramics Company, which has grown into a multinational uh, high-tech conglomerate, employing over 30,000 people and supplying the world with a wide range of products that utilize fine ceramics technology, including semiconductor packages, cell phones, and solar cells. When Japan's telecommunications industry was liberalized in 1984, he was an early leader in this emergent sector, establish establishing the DDI Corporation, now known as KDDI, as a way of lowering telephone costs for Japanese citizens. Chairman and Chairman Emeritus of KDDI until recently, Dr. Inamori continues as an honorary advisor uh, to this major Japanese corporation that has become one of Japan's largest telecommunications networks. Over the years, Dr. Inamori has consolidated his, his beliefs about management and business into what has become known as the Kyocera philosophy, a business philosophy based on the notion that one can serve people while making a profit, and that an entrepreneur's highest calling is to serve the greater good of humanity and society. Inamori's broad view has led him to believe that for human civilization to progress, we not only need advances in science and technology, but also in philosophy and arts. This view led him to establish the Inamori Foundation in 1984 using his personal funds. And this foundation is best known uh, for its annual awarding of the Kyoto Prize. Similar in intent to the Nobel Prize, this international award honors individuals who have made outstanding contributions in the, to the progress of science, technology, but also the enrichment of the human spirit in arts and philosophy. And at UC Berkeley, we're honored uh, that we have Dr. Uh, and Professor Richard Karp, who is the 2008 winner of the Kyoto Prize in the area of advanced technology and information science. Dr. Inamori's Philanthropic gifts have also led to the establishment of such institutions as Case Western University's Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence and its Inamori Ethics Prize. And in 2003, Dr. Inamori established the Seiwa Social Welfare Association for taking care 
of abused, neglected, and orphaned children, and the Inamori Social Welfare Foundation for supporting such children in Kyoto Prefecture. These days, Dr. Inamori serves as president of the Sewa Juku School for Business Education, a private business school with uh, roughly 60 branches, including seven outside of Japan, one right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Through systematic study of his unique management philosophy, thousands of young business owners and entrepreneurs have been inspired to be leaders of their own enterprises. His representative books articulating his business philosophy have been translated to, into English as a passion for success, practical inspiration on spiritual insights from Japan's leading entrepreneur, 1995. A book came, that came out in 1997, for profit and for uh, for people for people and for profit, a business philosophy for the 21st century. In 1999, respecting the divine and love people, my philosophy of business management, and forthcoming, I understand later this year, a compass to fulfillment, passion, and spirituality in life and business. Today, Dr. Inamori will speak about his management philosophy in a lecture entitled. Partnership Management That Values Employees. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Kazuo Inamori. Thank you for your kind introduction. My name is Inamori. Today, I would like to talk about partnership management that values employees uh, to give some of my ideas to you. The financial crisis that started with the subprime loan problems in the United States has now spread all over the world. The global financial market has fallen into chaos and all economies have been effective. If this situation continues, there is the possibility that another worldwide Great Depression might recur. I believe the direct cause of this financial crisis is the excessive manipulation of securities and related items. But underneath that, um, it seems to me that uh, people will resort to any means of maximizing profits to satisfy their own desires, including the use of highly sophisticated engineered derivatives and other financial commodities. This is what I see as the underlying problems of today's capitalism. The financial crisis also exposed management problems with the American way of doing business, which is becoming the global standard. Americans focus excessively on shareholder profit and ROE, pursuing short-term profit in a performance-based climate. Until now, for the last 50 years, it's exactly half a century now, I've been involved in management. The management, what I aimed for, is not that kind of American management style. Fortunately, uh, we at Kyocera, which was founded as a manufacturer of fine ceramic components, has continued to grow and has become a general electronics manufacturer uh, producing uh, all kinds of electronic products. From about 25 years ago, when the telecommunications market was deregulated in Japan, I found so founded KDDI as a uh, long distance uh, carrier and KDDI has grown rapidly to become the number two general telecommunications carrier in Japan. As at the end of March 2008, the combined revenue of these groups was approximately 5 trillion yen, about 56 billion dollars, and the pretax profit is 550 billion yen, approximately 5.6 billion dollars. 
My management style can be expressed as partnership management that values employees. Today, I would like to introduce the way in which I have been managing these companies. First of all, I would like to look back when I established Kyocera. When I graduated from U.S. University, I uh, joined a company uh, that was involved in fine ceramics. And it was a very uh, satisfying uh, result for me uh, to uh, work on commercializing the materials that I developed. However, three years after joining this company, my manager and I had a difference of opinion, so I decided to leave the company. At that time, I had a very fortunate uh, friends uh, who appreciated my uh, research and supported uh, the establishment of my company. One of them even mortgaged his house to finance my business. And with seven colleagues who believed in me, uh, who said they would uh, follow me, uh, I founded Kyocera in 1959. I had 27 employees uh, with 3 million yen in capital, and we started our business in a rented building. I did not have any experience in or knowledge of management, so I was always uh, racking my brains, uh, searching for the essence of what is a good management. I was young, and the only experience uh, I had was as an engineer, but I had to perform duties as a manager. This heavy responsibility uh, kept me awake at nights. After much anguish, I reached the conclusion that the most important aspect was the human mind. If we look back on history, we can find examples of the great accomplishments achieved through unifying human minds. For example, the Meiji Restoration, uh, which modernized Japan, or the American uh, independence movement were achieved through determination and team spirit among the people. In contrast, there are many examples of the collapse of organizations and groups uh, where un the underlying cause was the ruin in people's hearts. Human minds can be fickle and uncertain, yet once people understand and believe in each other, there is nothing stronger or more reliable than the human mind. We had very meager amount of resources in terms of people, capital and facilities in which to manage our business. We were almost unknown and had almost no credibility. Under these conditions, I thought that the only way for our company to survive was to build trusting relationships and rely on the bonds of human minds. Soon after I established Kyocera, I experienced an incident that convinced me once again that the important element for managing a company was management based on the bonds of human minds. It made me think about what the true purpose of managing a company would be. During the second year of my business, I hired about 10 new high school graduates. After they worked for a little over a year, and after I had begun to view them as experienced employees, they brought me a signed letter with a number of demands which amounted to collective bargaining. The letter demanded uh, guaranteed work conditions, a minimum pay raise, and an annual bonus for each employee in the future. I had told them uh, during the interview process that I don't know what I can do, but I will do my best to make Kyocera an excellent company. And I asked them whether they would like to work in such a company. They understood my condition, I thought, uh, and joined the company. But after only one year, they were issuing demands, saying, unless you can guarantee us these things for the future, we will quit. I responded to them that I could not agree to their re demands. 
It had only been three years since Kyocera had been uh, in, uh, established, and I was not sure about the future of our company. I was only earnestly thinking that if I worked incredibly hard, uh, we could survive. I didn't have a clear vision for the future. If I promised to meet their labor demands, it would have been a lie, and I could not uh, make a promise when I didn't have the confidence or certainty that I would be able to meet their demands. We did not finish our discussions uh, at the office, uh, so we went to my ho home to continue. I was living in un municipal housing at the time. They stubbornly resisted my efforts to persuade them, and our discussions lasted for three days and nights. No matter how earnestly I explained myself, they did not agree with me. They said capitalists always sweet talk and deceive workers. So I said, I have no desire uh, to work only for myself as a business leader to succeed. I want to grow Kyocera into a company where all employees will be happy that they joined. Why don't you take a chance on me and find out if my words are true or false? I intend to work hard and grow this company even if my life is at risk. If I betray you by doing a lousy job or work only for my own selfish benefit, you can kill me if you like. As a result of this uh, discussion, uh, they with withdrew their demands and they did not quit the company. They worked harder than ever before. This incident gave me an opportunity to learn the principles of managing a business. Until then, my original motivation had been, uh, as an engineer, to prove uh, that my technology would be appreciated by society. And as the second son of seven brothers and sisters, I was expected to take care of my parents and younger siblings in uh, Kagoshima. This incident made me realize that I needed to struggle to uh, support uh, the employees of my company, and not just my family obligations. Uh, the employees that were not even related to me. And I was filled with anxiety and realized, what have I started? I realized that the purpose of managing a company was not to realize my personal dreams, but must be to provide for the well-being and livelihood of all the employees and their families now and in the future. I felt this way because there was a general public perception in Japan at the time that a company should guarantee lifetime job security. So I listed as a top priority of management to pursue both the material and intellectual growth of all employees, to contribute to the progress and development of mankind and society. I added to the Kyotsura uh, philosophy so that, that could be, we could be a responsible member of society. This is what I set out as our management rationale. Almost 50 years have passed since then, and I believe that the secret to Kyocera's success is that we have been following the management rationale for the material and intellectual growth of all our employees. Kyocera uh, was founded on so strong spiritual bonds that we had with each other and which we have continued to this day. By placing this bond at the core of our management, I was able to avoid selfish motivations as a leader and develop myself fully toward achieving the happiness of our employees. Our employees have placed their complete trust in our company and use their abilities to the fullest. Uh, I also uh, strive to make Kyocera a highly profitable company so that we can realize the material and intellectual growth of all our employees. 
Many Japanese companies are satisfied with single-digit profit margins, but we have strived to become a company that always earns a double-digit pre-tax pro pre profit. I've thought profit is what you are left with after subtracting expenses from revenues. Therefore, if we maximize revenues and minimize expenses, the result will be profit. So we have faithfully adhered to this principle, maximize revenues and minimize expenses in managing the companies. Consequently, we've been able to realize a minimum of 10% pre-tax profit and a maximum of over 40% profit. So with these profits, we have retained earnings within the company. As a result, Kyocera has become a highly profitable company of top quality. And the CPAs describe our balance sheets as being beautiful. We've been one of the most financially healthy companies in Japan with an excellent balance sheet. That's Kyocera has currently a cash that we can use at any time for about 600 billion yen, approximately 6.7 billion U.S. dollars, and about 400 billion yen, 4.5 billion yen in unrealized assets such as stocks. So our total retained earnings amount to approximately 1 trillion yen, 11.2 billion dollars. As we have retained such large earnings, uh, even during this recession, we can uh, go forward without borrowing uh, from banks. So my management style uh, has been criticized by some uh, U.S. investors who value ROE, and they say that uh, I should raise the ROE, they should not hoard profits, and they should return the profits to the stockholders and use them for company acquisitions and capital investment and reduce the equity capital. But I, I have never listened to that sort of opinion or criticism. For shareholders who own our stocks for short periods, it may be true that it would be better to increase the dividends and have a, a higher ROE or return on equity. However, in the long run, to achieve stable operations for the material and intellectual growth of all of our employees, I think the most important thing is to be able to withstand whatever problems we might encounter in a long recession. So we need a, the most important thing is to create a strong financial foundation. In other words, I think that management that just values a return on equity is a type of management that values share, shareholders and short-term profits. But I have always valued employees and tried to use a long-term perspective to manage my companies. But that, my uh, management style, that doesn't mean that my management style does not or neglects the shareholders. I'm convinced that the company can achieve continuous growth by valuing its employees and having, their ex and exer having them exercise their powers to the fullest. In the long run, I think that this will actually maximize the shareholders' interests. So my partnership style of management is created to, it's based on the bond of human minds to create trust between in management, employee in relations within the company. That doesn't mean that I indulge the employees or that I always accommodate and accept whatever the labor union may dem demand us. I always set high goals for us and I work together with the employees, with the management, to achieve those goals. With these sorts of high goals, sharing the same philosophies and the same sorts of hopes with the employees and working together to achieve them, we, I, I have put together a management style that I call management that aligns our vectors by showing what kind of direction we have in management clearly to employees the manager, manager can align the vectors of all the employees, just like shining a light through a lens, a convergent light through a lens, a lens which intensifies its powers towards a common goal. 
So I think that the most important thing is to share the same philosophy. We have people who come together in an organization who are born in different places, they're raised in different environments. So as a business leader, I have to explain that what sort of management we're going to have, what sort of management direction we're going to have, and ensure that everybody understands it. This is not an easy thing to do. So in my case, I, whenever I've had, had the chance, I always talk to the employees. I always got hold, grabbed hold of them and I told them I wanted to develop the company in this or that way and with this sort of philosophy and that we needed to have this sort of philosophy and this sort of attitude in order to accomplish this. Uh, when the employees heard me say these things, uh, some of them, I could see that some of them had a sparkle in their eyes and they were agreeing or nodding earnestly, but others were had a sort of a vacant look or a glassy-eyed look, and they didn't seem to understand anything. I s tried to explain my philosophy repeatedly to them for hours on, uh, hours on end until they all understood and agreed to it from the bottom of their hearts. It's many, many, people think, many people think that I shouldn't spend so much time trying to persuade my employees to do these things, that it's better just to make them work as hard as possible. But I always kept talking to employees until they could fully understand my explanation, and we could share the same philosophy. In the event that an employee could not share the philosophy in the same manner, in spite of my efforts, if they couldn't align their vectors with the company, then, then if they're, then I would ask them, if they couldn't align their vectors, I would have to ask them to leave the company, or we would uh, both become unhappy. This was the extent of my efforts. But I think, as a result, we established wonderful human relationships within the company, and that was because of diligently explaining the philosophy to employees, and the employees uh, didn't mind sharing any kind of hardships with me, and they were willing to try new, uh, they were work, willing to work harder than anyone else, they were willing to exert uh, themselves more than anyone else because of these strong relationships that we had. And we, we it's very important, I think, to raise or foster employees who can ar rise to these challenges in new fields, especially in today's environment when we have a recession. I think that human relationships within a company are even more important. You might see that, uh, you might even say that a recession is like a litmus test to test the relationships between an employer and employees. Uh, when we have really difficult management circumstances, we have to make requests, management has to make very difficult requests of our employees. And that's when the true relationship that we have with our employees is revealed. On the other hand, an economic recession also provides in opportunities to not only understand workers' minds, but to reestablish and make them more solid, make more solid relationships. I uh, went through an experience uh, like that, actually, when I was in my early 30s. It goes back to uh, October 1973, when the first oil crisis struck. At the time, I was still in my 40s, in my early 40s. And the oil shock, uh, the, the, uh, the next year after the oil shock, in early 1974, the economic conditions uh, drastically deteriorated. In the case of Estera, Kyo Sera, to give you an example, in 1974, in January, we had uh, orders, monthly orders, that amounted to $31 million. But six months later, in July, that had dropped to 200 and 270 million yen, or $3 million. In other words, we had only one-tenth of the orders that we'd had before. And on the production floor, we basically had 90% too, too many uh, workers. We had an excess of 90% of the workers. So, since our orders had dropped to one-tenth, and the productivity, productivity would normally have dropped significantly. But in order to maintain the efficient production structure that I had worked so hard to create, I decided to use one-tenth of the workforce to produce one-tenth of the orders. So, the rest of the workers, therefore, took turns 
uh, cleaning up the factory area, the production areas, uh, working in the flower gardens, the flower, uh, maintaining the grounds of the plants, and participating in education and training programs. In addition to this, uh, I was a I was the pre pre president, of course, but I instituted a pay cut for all managers, including myself. I took a 30% pay cut and a minimum pay cut for team managers, 7%. I personally took a 30% uh, pay cut, and the minimum pay cut for team managers was 7%. At the time, however, Japan was in the midst of its uh, rapid economic growth, and people were used to substantial salary increases every year. So even though I had instituted pay cuts, I had to confront the negotiation period for the next year's salary very quickly. So at the end of 1974, I asked Kyocera's union if they wouldn't accept a pay raise freeze. Now, the union members fortunately understood that labor and management have to act with the same heart and mind. And in the next year, they accepted my proposal for freezing the raises. In Japan at the time, however, there were a lot of union dis disputes at many companies, and there were a lot of problems between uh, management and unions, especially regarding wage increases. But the union at Kyocera very quickly cooperated with management and announced its acceptance of the wage increase freeze. The parent uh, organization to which uh, Kyocera's, Kyocera's union belonged criticized this decision that the Kyocera union had made and applied a lot of pressure on them. But the Kyocera union, uh, fortunately, stood firm and told them that we uh, they, and and told told the parent organization that they believed that to support the company they had to be all in the same boat, and uh, they said that they understood that management was requesting a freeze under this situation that the company was facing, and they said that if the parent organization could not accept their decision, that they would have no choice but to part ways with the parent organization, and actually Kyocera's union uh, thereafter broke off uh, from the parent union. I, of course, uh, greatly appreciated their decision. And when the economic conditions have recovered and improved again, and the company performance improved again, I made a decision to not only give them a substantial increase in the semi-annual bonus, but also to offer a special bonus. So in the next year, in 1976, I announced a salary increase of 22% given the pay phrase the year before, which gave them uh, two years worth of increases in res because of the trust that they had shown in me. So throughout this recession, we were able to reaffirm our confident and our strong relationship with the union. And during that period, in September 1975, Kyocera's stock actually hit the highest price ever recorded in Japan, even surpassing that of Sony's, which at the time was the stock price leader. And I really believe that this was the result of the fact that we were able to uh, bond, the employees and the management were able to bond uh, their minds and align their vectors. I have subsequently tried to tried hard to practice this principle of what I call management by all. And to understand this, I'd like to just reflect, I'd like to just uh, touch on uh, I'd like to go back to the time of Kyocera's founding to give you an example of how I came about this. When, uh, at the time when Kyocera was founded, I, I had been in charge of overseeing all the departments, including R&D, production, sales, and administration. But there was a limit to what I could do. There was a limit to the number of hats that I could wear, especially as the organization kept getting bigger. I felt it was important and necessary to, to establish a structure that gave responsibilities to each leader in managing a subdivided organization, operation of a large organization. For example, the top management of SME companies, of small and medium-sized companies, they manage their operations in a creative manner to try and generate profit in areas where established companies cannot. And I think that, I believe that leaders 
who have the same kind of management mentality as the top management of the SME companies could be trained internally by establishing a strong organizational structure as theirs. And I think that also that each employee, even the far ends of the organization, would be able to better understand the management goals and extend their best efforts to improve the performance of their respective areas. And we can do this by dividing an organization into small units, which would bring my ideal management principle of management by all to fruition. So with this in mind, I came up with a concept of a small division profit center system, what I call the amoeba management system. And I adopted it as Kyocera's management accounting system shortly before, after uh, Kyocera's began. Uh, because I call these units amoebas because their structures can easily change depending on the surrounding environment. But each amoeba trades internally with other amoebas, just as small or mid-sized mediums do. And there are a variety of structures in these amoeba, amoeba organizations. Some amoeba organizations are organized by product line. And to manufacture a pr single product at high volume, some amoebas are organized by product production processes. And generally, in general, uh, we, need a, uh, we need a general standard set for the size of, a, of an amoeba. But just like real amoebas, these organizations can freely change their size and the way they're structured depending on the business environment. The management responsibility of each amoeba organization is basically given to an amoeba group leader. Of course, they have to report to upper management for approvals, but each leader has a responsibility to oversee all of the management activities of the amoeba, including the business planning, performance results, purchasing of goods, and even labor organization. So an amoeba leader at Kyocera uh, therefore, therefore, even if they're only around 30 years, they'll be trained to have excellent management capabilities while maintaining a strong strength of profitability. After uh, joining the company, young employees are quickly trained to have a sense of profitability. Uh, therefore, when superiors give them instructions that might cause wasteful expenditures, they can confidently point out that these, this would increase expenses. We also use a unique financial method to show each amoeba's ame operational performance. It is expressed by showing the added value per hour generated by each amoeba. In short, the revenue generated by an amoeba in one month is subtracted by all of its expenses, excluding labor cost, leaving added value. Then the added value is divided by the total working hours in a month. The result is called hourly efficiency. This becomes our management index. In this way, we can compare each amoeba's operational performance fairly. Based on this hour efficiency index, uh, the amoebas can compete with each other in a friendly manner to improve their operational performance every month. Even under such competition, they spare no effort to achieve the common goal of the company's development because they share our common management rationale, which I've explained earlier. Regarding this hourly efficiency system, uh, some people uh, may think that an amoeba achieves high performance, uh, that each member will be compensated based on the results, but we have never done such a thing. Amoeba management is not a system to compensate employee efforts by cash bonus based on work performance. The most important thing in amoeba management is not to calculate an amoeba's profit, but to understand how much its val added value generated per hour contributes to the whole company. And therefore, there is no bonus or cash reward. Money and goods uh, can influence people's minds, but 
that would be only in the short term. Uh, in amoeba management, the highest reward is the satisfaction of receiving praise or appreciation from trusted co-workers for outstanding performance. Of course, the amoeba leaders and members who achieve a high business performance are highly regarded internally within the company so that their efforts will be rewarded in the long run. In any case, the foundation of amoeba management is established based on the management rationale that the purpose of the company is not only to pursue profit for management and shareholders, but also to work for the happiness of all our employees. Therefore, without any hesitation, I can ask all Amoeba members to work very hard. Based on this confidential, uh, the confident relationship we have established, I have been able to promote transparency in Amoeba management. That is, I advocated transparent management so that all employees, from managers to those at the bottom of the organization, would be able to understand our orders, our completion to plan, profitability, and how it is used, and the situation of the amoeba, workplace, and company. This from the top level of the organization to uh, the lower uh, level employees as well. This naturally increases the employee's trust in the company and provides motivation in his or her work. To practice uh, transparent management to its fullest also greatly contributes to keeping morale high within the company. If top management uses uh, company expenses for their personal gain or indiscreet entertainment, then it will affect the employee's trust and demoralization will quickly spread through the entire organization like a wildfire, leading to total breakdown of the company. In recent years, some of the top executives of companies around the world have pursued their own personal interests, committing misdeeds that often end up in corporate crises. In light of such, situ such situations, this transparent management is very effective, especially for enforcing internal discipline to avoid such incidents. I've been discussing my thoughts on partnership management. Now I would like to talk about my philosophy which became the basis of my management system. This philosophy is to pursue management based on the fundamental principle. In other words, a universal decision-making criterion needs to be established internally. When at the inception of uh, Kyocera, I had to become involved uh, in managing the company without having any experience or knowledge about corporate management. When I actually established Kyocera and got involved in corporate management, I was forced to make decisions in a variety of areas every day, no matter what the circumstances. Since the company was just established, one incorrect decision on the part of top management could lead to the collapse of the company. Therefore, it was necessary to have a very clear decision-making criteria. After thorough consideration, I realized that no decision, including those in management, should go against the fundamental principle of ethical thinking and morals that we hold. Otherwise, nothing will go well. Therefore, I reached the conclusion that all decisions should go back to the fundamental principle. In other words, I committed to making decisions by asking whether or not it is the right thing to do as a human being. 
I decided to only do things in the correct manner and pursue the right thing as a human being. Correct and incorrect, good and bad, constitute the basic moral code of human beings, no matter where, in the East or the West. This code is taught to us by our parents and teachers over and over again since childhood. And it becomes the most familiar criterion embedded within us. I thought if I had made decisions based on this criterion, then I would probably avoid making any major mistakes, even without having experience or knowledge. In fact, on a variety of occasions, I have made decisions based on this fundamental principle. It was since I didn't have any management knowledge or business experience that I had to think for myself and find an answer to this fundamental question. This process helped me to take the right path in all the challenges I faced, not only in management, but in every aspect of my life. As a human being, I strive to ba base all of my judgments on what is the right thing to do. It isn't what is beneficial beneficial for Kyosera or what is good for me as an individual that really matters. We must carry out the right practice which we as human beings can be proud of, overstepping the shallow ideas about the profit and loss of a corporation or of any one individual. In other words, I followed this fundamental principle which has led both to my business and personal life in wonderful directions. It, and the re reason is that I was able to uh, use this principle uh, for my management uh, decisions as well. Some people think we could never survive in today's tough competitive business world with such an idea, or such a fancy philosophy can't help us win over other companies and make a profit. But Speaking from my own business experience, practicing this principle of what is the right thing to do as a human being is the driving factor in making a business grow. I explained at the beginning about my uh, KDDI corporation uh, establishment. I'd like to use that as an example. of how I grew that company. I had been conducting business deals in the United States since early in my career, and I was aware that the U.S. telephone charges were significantly lower than those in Japan. And I felt strongly that American industries, as well as the general public, were receiving immeasurable benefit and convenience from this. So when in 1984, when Japan's telecommunications market was finally deregulated, I expected many companies uh, to jump in and lower the long-distance phone charges. But there was not a single private corporation uh, that was willing to enter the market. Uh, they were most likely reluctant to take on uh, such big risks competing against the almighty NTT, the government-owned company that monopolized the market. So uh, I had my thoughts about wanting to uh, lower long-distance uh, telephone costs uh, for uh, the people of Japan um, to benefit the society and its people. But I did not immediately jump into the uh, market. In those days, I started asking myself questions before I went to sleep each night. I asked, is my motivation for wanting to enter into the telecommunications business purely to benefit the general public by lowering long-distance phone charges? 
Is it absolutely pure without any clouded uh, self-interest in mind? Am I being vain, trying to make myself look good in the eyes of society? Is this only grandstanding? Is my motive virtuous as a human being? Is this a selfless act that has absolutely no selfish intentions? I was very severe in the way I questioned uh, myself uh, regarding these issues. After de deliberating thoroughly for about six months, I was absolutely confident that my motives were virtuous and I held no selfish greed. Then I made an announcement of our intention to enter into the new common carriers field and move forward to establish a new company. When we announced our decision, we found that two other companies had also decided to participate. So Japan's new telecommunications market opened with three mar companies. Of the three companies, uh, DDI, currently KDDI, uh, which was initiated by Kyocera, was said to be at a huge disadvantage when compared to the other two. The reason was that I, as a top executive, had no experience in the telecommunications field and that Kyocera itself had no telecommunication-related technology. The other two uh, companies uh, could use uh, the railways or highways uh, to build a communications infrastructure, but we had no such uh, uh, ability. And we didn't have a com powerful conglomerate behind us to uh, help in sales and marketing activities. But despite these disadvantage con disadvantageous conditions, KDDI has been leading the way and showing the best performance record of the three new common carrier companies. Today, the other two competitors no longer exist. Many people ask me how we manage to overcome all of these adversities. I always say to them, it's a matter of mental attitude. The reason we have succeeded where others didn't is because we tackled this project with a sincere mind. Uh, since then, since founding the company, I've been telling the uh, employees that for the sake of the public, we should try hard, we should do everything we can to lower the long distance phone charges as much as we can. And as a result, all the employees of KDDI now share the same spirit of working hard for the public good. And they want the project to succeed, and they work hard. We've dedicated to ourselves to, to our work and strive toward our goals. And after the seeing what the KDI employees and our sales, our sales agents and customers also started giving us our support and compliments. And they created a community of people who uh, shared the same beliefs and wonderful spirits around KDDI, resulting in a better business performance and more successful uh, projects. So this resulted in, uh, we, I believe that this philosophy resulted in better, better performance. Now the success of KDDI is one of uh, the examples, I think, that supports this belief in what I call the fundamental principles. And it just demonstrates that your business will succeed if you manage it with a pure heart and a beautiful heart and continue to do the right thing as a human being with a, with a, a sincere and selfless mind we're contributing to society and people. I think it's an excellent example that illustrates that. And regarding these pure and noble beliefs, there is a, a 20th century a British philosopher named James Allen who said the following. He said that the impure man avoids action because he is afraid. But the pure man will step in without any hesitation, often achieving victory easily, because the pure man directs his energies with a calmer mind and a greater clarity and strength of purpose. 
When I look back over the history of KDDI since the company began, I'm reconvinced that its success is a result of the fact that we had a, severe, a sincere philosophy that led us to do the right things as human beings. I'm convinced of this. There's money, capital, human resources, management resources. Other companies had may, many other things, many more than we ever we, we had. But they're the ones that withdrew from the competition, contrary to what people expected. I think that KDDI survived and was the only company that survived and continued to develop in the industry because I managed it based on my management resource. And I truly believe that the sincere and pure philosophy is the most important element in leading companies and human beings to success. Now, today, I've been talking about what I believe in and the partnership management and the management based on the fundamental principles. And I, I know that in the United States, this may represent a different style of management philosophy than what you have. Uh, later on, after I finish uh, uh, speaking, I believe there's a Q&A uh, session. And I, if, uh, if we have time, I would be glad to answer any questions that you might have. But I do hope, I sincerely hope that my talk will be helpful in the management of U.S. companies that are suffering oper operational difficulties because of the current economic crisis, and also help the people who are gathered here at the Japan Studies, the Center for Japan Studies, which contributes greatly to the advancement of research on Japan here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Inamori, for your very useful presentation. I think we're going to move uh, now into the Q&A session. And as the MC, I have a couple of questions, actually, that I prepared on my own. Uh, first of all, in the, I'm the uh, uh, head of the uh, study center here, but actually my majors or my specialty is in Buddhism. So and listening to what you said today, I sense that uh, this uh, amoeba style management and the emphasis on employee uh, ha happiness and also the uh, aligning the vectors in people's minds, it, it, it sounded uh, somewhat Buddhistic to me. Uh, for example, in Sh Shinran's uh, Jiririta Emma, which might roughly be translated as self benefit, other benefit, one big circle. It sounds rather that uh, similar to the uh, some of the ideas that you expressed about employer employee partnership, and I think it was in 1997 that uh, uh, Mr. Kanamori that you actually were ordained as a Rinzai Zen Buddhist priest, and I know that of course. Uh, far before then, long before them, you had been very interested in Buddhism. But I wonder if you could comment a little bit on how uh, Buddhism has affected your philosophy. Uh, could you just speak, comment on that very briefly? My uh, parents actually were very fervent believers in uh, Jodo Shinshu, the sect of Buddhism. So from the time of my childhood, I was very familiar with Buddhism. And from morning to night, uh, I was in front of the altar at home, and uh, I prayed for uh, Buddha. And because I was raised in that sort of environment, when I, after I created the Kyosera Company, uh, the Rinzai sect uh, has a very uh, famous uh, priest, and I became acquainted with him. And I received a lot of uh, wonderful advice on uh, living from him. And in 60, at 65, I was actually able to be ordained as a priest. Of course, I shaved my head at the time, and I was in a temple. Um, and the priest then told me that uh, as, a, as a businessman leader of, of a private company, 
uh, the contributing to human society is your is my duty. He told me that that was my duty and that I should do my training based on that and, and, and that uh, I should contribute to human society. So because of that environment, as was just mentioned, just to respond to your question, uh, I think uh, sympathy, sympathy and compassion uh, in the Buddhist world there's this concept of um, making of 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 of, of making don donations. There's a concept of making fusse or do donations, and this re requires a uh, compassionate spirit. And I think that's at the heart of Buddhism. This compassionate spirit is one that's at the heart of the Buddhist uh, belief. It's the core of Buddhist beliefs, the offerings. And this is uh, not just Buddhism, of course. I think it's true of all religions, but you have to love others. You have to forget yourself. You have to ignore yourself and, and love others. And this, of course, is a wonderful thing to do. And in, but in doing so, as was mentioned, as I mentioned, uh, you, when you make a contribution, you get something back. And that's something, there's a return on your contribution. And that's something that uh, Buddhism really taught me, and I think this is absolutely true. Uh, from the time I was a child, uh, at the, uh, well, of course, I was, I was taught by people at the temple that helping people and being nice to people, uh, you, you see, uh, your child might think it's, uh, that, that you're giving up something, but actually you will always get something back. Something good will come of it. I was always uh, taught that. And, and they was always uh, the priest would always uh, have a, a board in front of me with some water on it, a, a basin with water in it, and then the water. He, you could, you, if you if you if you move the water one way, the water would shift one way. Uh, and the, the basin, of course, is round, and you could see that the water would come back. So, in other words, by giving giving, you get something in return. And this was something that the priests always had told me that it was a basic principle of the world, and that uh, uh, when B Buddha re realized the truth of the universe, that's something that he had taught. Of course, currently. Everybody thinks that they look great. Everybody wants to make money. Everybody tries to get what they can for themselves. And the more they, uh, the more they try to do this, the more they lose. Uh, this is something that uh, Buddha also teaches us. So, as a business leader, I, I think it's critical to take good care of the employees and and that they will pay me back, that they will return whatever I give to them. So that philosophy that I have really comes from Buddhism. Thank you very much for your comments. And I think there's, uh, uh, since I'm involved in studying Buddhism, uh, just want to ask you a question about Japan in the future. And I know that uh, within Japan and also in the United States right now, there's a curiosity, there's sort of interest in what sort of direction Japan is going to take in, in the 21st century. There are a lot of people who are worried about what sort of direction uh, Japan might take, both in terms of politics and also economics. Uh, there's a lot of people who uh, are a little bit concerned, or there may be problems in, up in the fu uh, facing in the f us in the future. And I. I real, I'm sure you have thoughts on this, and I wonder if you could comment on what Japan would like to do. Do you think, for example, that the monozukuri concept of making things, that, that will be the basis for the Japanese economy in the future? It, it, or what, 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 do you, what do you foresee, what do you foresee in, uh, for Japan in the 21st century in this regard? How do you see Japan developing in this regard? Uh, that's actually a very difficult question that you've asked here. Uh, Japan is the monozukuri uh, country. It's a country that it's uh, made its reputation on manufacturing things, and now it's the second uh, has the second largest GDP in the world. Um, and we we make try making precision uh, things. Uh, precision equipment is a very important thing. It's a, it's a very important business for us that supports our, our our economy today. And I think in the future, uh, manufacturing things and supplying them to the world, um, it's probably the only uh, direction that we can take in Japan. Now, in in Japan, we have the peace con constitution. You may be aware of so. Uh, 
In the Constitution itself, we have abandoned uh, belligerency and, uh, and the right to go to war. So we have to maintain ourselves in a state of peace with, uh, in the world. And I know that there are some people in Japan who want to change this posture. But I believe that we need to protect the peace constitution and use our economic power to contribute to world peace and to help poor people and to be, therefore, become respected and trusted by people around the world. That's my belief. And it's in this regard, I can say uh, right now we have a, there are a lot of environmental problems. And if we think of these environmental problems, Right now, the world's population is uh, increasing r rapidly. And I imagine around uh, 2050, about uh, 40 years from now, the population of the world will exceed 9 billion. That's what this, uh, the scientists are telling us. Uh, 9 billion people in the world, 9 billion humans in the world will all whether they belong to advanced companies or developing companies, uh, they, they, will want, they, they will want more convenient lives, more uh, affluent lives. And they're all making efforts in this regard. Everybody's working hard in this regard. So when, we've, when the population has reached a 9 billion and everybody is expecting an even more, uh, a better life, uh, well, in, in the context of energy and food, I think uh, uh, 9 billion, uh, 10 billion people, we may not have enough material to support everyone. So there may be more complex, there may be more conflicts between peoples. Uh, right now there's uh, a lot of problems. Some people are talking about nuclear proliferation and I think uh, there may be conflicts uh, where people, that continue where people uh, continue to shed blood. But when I think of the global environment, when I look at things from the global environment, uh, from the environmental uh, standpoint, I think that uh, humanity is really confronting a huge crisis. But in this context, uh, Japan should be able to, to, to tell the world that it is possible to exist in peace with other people. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Inamori, I wonder if I could ask you to come up to one of the two mics here on the left and the right of the stage. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, please keep your questions fairly brief and precise. Um, if you could mention your name and affiliation before you ask your question uh, and direct it to Dr. Inamori, uh, we'd appreciate it very much. If you wouldn't mind, if you could come up to the mics, please. If you wouldn't mind, if you could come up to the mics, please. Thank you very much for today. My name is Takahashi, and I'm a PhD student uh, in um, uh, engineering. My question is uh, regarding um, the management. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it was a uh, lifetime employment that has been uh, the standard in Japan, but now uh, I don't think uh, uh, Japan can uh, continue having uh, uh, lifetime employment uh, conditions. So the people in their uh, 20s and 30s uh, are uh, struggling because they only have uh, temporary uh, jobs um, because of the lifetime employment guaranteed to the people who are now in their 50s and 60s. And so I think the younger people are quite um, uh, disbelieving uh, in uh, lifetime employment. Um, so what is the kind, the structure of uh, uh, employee uh, relations that you can uh, think of um, in that light? My management um, philosophy 
is uh, not necessarily a complete lifetime uh, guarantee of employment, but I do uh, plan to continue uh, to have a rather uh, long-term uh, employment. Uh, we do not use uh, any uh, part-timers or any temporary uh, workers. I'm sorry, there are some part-time people um, who um, only want to work from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. because uh, uh, they have uh, family responsibilities that work about five hours uh, per day. But uh, the others are all uh, full employees. And uh, using uh, these full employees and not contract or uh, temporary employees, uh, then um, <laughs> I don't have that kind of uh, nefarious um, uh, attitude of, of using uh, temporary or contract workers uh, so that um, uh, the, long, the older generation can stay on. So I th well, of course, the U.S. has um, this kind of contract employees, um, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, Japan, too, because they have uh, pursued profits, uh, they've um, uh, started using uh, contract employees. The, some of the young people uh, have this attitude that they don't want to uh, be stuck in a company uh, for their entire uh, career. Um, they do uh, have, there are more people, young people, uh, coming into the workforce uh, that uh, want to uh, have a freer uh, ability to work for a while and then quit. Uh, so, uh, I think it's it's become popular uh, to have uh, this kind of um, employee situation where they're just uh, contract or temporary employees. But when full-time employees and contract employees are working within the company on the same type of work, uh, then I think uh, that is like um, throwing sand into uh, the uh, situation uh, in the workforce. Uh, so I think uh, that doesn't, that will not uh, be a good uh, way of managing a company. So. When uh, young people say, I don't want lifetime employment, um, I just uh, want to be able to free as to wh uh, where and how much I want to work. And if you um, don't need uh, me anymore, then I'm glad to be let go. If they can be that uh, uh, dry, that, that uh, really uh, convinced about uh, that method, uh, then uh, that would be good. But I don't think Japanese society is quite like that. So as long as uh, uh, all Japanese companies uh, have uh, the uh, wonderful management style that you have, uh, then there won't be this problem. And yes, that's what I'm uh, telling people now, that if um, uh, they were able to have this uh, more uh, beneficent uh, life uh, management style, then uh, they'll be able to um, uh, have a better uh, relationship now. My name is Haeno, and I'm at the Haas School of Business as a student uh, studying management. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting comments. I've learned a lot today. And my question um, is that in Japan, uh, to it's a very Tokyo-centered uh, life uh, where, where th uh, things as well as information um, is uh, uh, concentrated in uh, Tokyo. Um, uh, you have, um, you're from Kagoshima and you have uh, made, uh, established the company in Kyoto, not in Tokyo. Uh, what is your feeling about the um, vitality or the economic situation of areas outside of the central uh, Tokyo area? I uh, was born and raised in Kagoshima in Kyushu and I started a, uh, the company in Kyoto. As you say, Tokyo is, uh, Japan is very centralized uh, in uh, Tokyo. 
and uh, the uh, provincial uh, cities um, are not as uh, economically uh, active uh, as Tokyo. It's not just me. Uh, there are some important uh, companies in uh, Kyoto, Kyocera, uh, Nintendo, and Rome, Murata, and there are several other global companies that ha are based in Kyoto. For these Kyoto companies have their headquarters in Kyoto. The Osaka companies have all their headquarters established, re-established in Tokyo. There are a few old Osaka companies remaining, but in Kyoto, these major companies uh, have their Everybody lives at the, cent the headquarters uh, of that company uh, in Kyoto. And that's disadvantageous. For example, um, uh, various uh, committees uh, and uh, various advisory uh, groups uh, uh, for the government uh, meet, have breakfast meetings and other meetings uh, that are all held in Tokyo, where the capital is. Uh, so uh, if you uh, join one of these um, uh, committees, uh, then you have to s spend a couple of days uh, in uh, Tokyo doing this. And so even the, uh, in terms of being on a board of directors, uh, you also have to um, spend a lot of time in Tokyo. Uh, so the people who want to become very active in that sort of flashy way uh, want to uh, move to Tokyo uh, to work there. Uh, those who stay in uh, Kyoto are the ones who are uh, truly interested in uh, working on their own uh, companies. Uh, so in, in terms of multinational um, uh, aspects, uh, it's not that difficult to, to get from Kyoto to an international location. There's no problem with that. So those of, of companies uh, who are like medium-sized companies, um, uh, other than the ones that I mentioned in Kyoto, uh, is, is they're really having struggling. Uh, the uh, local area uh, cities um, are really uh, becoming uh, less and less economically viable. It's not like the U.S. or uh, China, where uh, things are more uh, distributed. There might be, uh, if we have different good incentives uh, in the various uh, regional uh, areas of Japan, I think we could uh, establish uh, more uh, vital uh, companies and vital ec economies um, uh, that is not Tokyo West. I'm in the Haas School of Business, and my name is Kanai. I'm uh, on the first year of um, uh, an MBA program. Uh, I was doing some uh, consulting um, to medium and small side companies in uh, Japan. And many companies uh, were very concerned about the successors, their successors, how to uh, develop uh, people, uh, how to uh, educate people who would become the next generation of, uh, of leaders of the company. And uh, many people uh, sort of leave Japan, abandon Japan, and come over to Silicon Valley and other companies to, to become entrepreneurs here. So I wonder what you have done in terms of uh, developing successor, successors uh, at uh, Kyocera. And my second question is, uh, what about uh, young people who do not remain in Japan? So what would be uh, the requirement uh, to have uh, very uh, excellent people uh, stay in Japan, return to Japan, uh, to uh, vitalize Japan. In terms of small and medium-sized companies uh, in Japan and their successors, um, I, I founded Kyocera, and I'm one of the major stockholders of uh, Kyocera. But 
I never thought from the beginning that I wanted uh, my own uh, family members uh, to uh, uh, be uh, the successors uh, to myself uh, within the company. So I uh, looked to uh, choosing uh, somebody from uh, among the management people uh, in uh, Kyocera. So in April, um, uh, actually the um, new uh, president uh, will take over in uh, June, uh, but I think they've um, been making their decision uh, to um, then have the succession uh, go smoothly. For in terms of um, a company like ours uh, that's a technological innovating company, So usually uh, somebody who has, um, uh, is an engineer or a scientist uh, becomes a head of the company. But they also need to have um, a ha wonderful uh, human qualities. And no matter how bright they might be, uh, I don't think uh, that can only uh, can uh, become uh, the criterion for them to become uh, a successor. I think uh, it's really important to look at their human aspects whether they have humanity or not. And in terms of the small and medium-sized companies in Japan, uh, the fact that they can't f easily find successors, it's true. Uh, a pers uh, young person whose father uh, had um, uh, run a small, medium-sized uh, company, uh, they don't like, they know what how difficult it is, so they're not interested in um, uh, becoming, succeeding their father. But sometimes uh, they um, go back when um, the founding father um, has uh, uh, some uh, illness or uh, has become aged. So I I think uh, people who perhaps haven't uh, had that much uh, uh, experience uh, in management uh, return uh, to um, go uh, to uh, succeed the company. And I don't think that's very good. So um, I have uh, encouraged people uh, join uh, my Sewa Juku um, to um, uh, teach the small-sized uh, management uh, methods uh, to these young people. Uh, so uh, I think that would really um, help uh, encourage younger people to uh, uh, succeed um, and, that it's a, and to tell them that how wonderful a, th a thing it is uh, to uh, continue uh, the company that was founded. And if um, the company may only have 15 employees, uh, but I think that is the kind of thing uh, that um, th those are where the important uh, issues are. The, we only talk about the big companies, uh, but uh, the most of the companies in the world, 90% are small companies. So I think uh, I try to tell people uh, that uh, they should have confidence um, and they should uh, really uh, get the experience so that they can um, uh, really uh, develop uh, the small companies. And there's some of my Sewajuku uh, members who are um, here uh, in the audience as well. But I know that people uh, who are working hard uh, in uh, the United States are trying to become uh, good entrepreneurs here. And I think uh, uh, we, I would like to encourage them as well. I th think I know um, uh, that people are having a lot of hardships uh, when they come abroad to America. And in this uh, multicultural uh, nation where people speak different languages, have different religions. I think the only thing uh, that will is important uh, to uh, pull those kinds of people together uh, is uh, this kind of uh, human quality. And unless a person can lead in that way, they cannot manage. So this is the strength 
it's it's not money uh, to uh, uh, okay it shouldn't be money uh, to uh, try to uh, have people work hard but it should be uh, the effort uh, the uh, benefit that will come to people uh, that will really um, be the basis for a good management uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd really like to ask you to uh, join me to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Inamori Kazuo for his wonderful lecture and, and his uh, willingness to answer all these uh, questions. Um, どうも今日はどうもありがとうございました.